All right, mic check one two one two. Can anybody hear me in the chat? Davateo, what's going on, bro? Blue man, what's going on? Now that you can hear me, hit the like button as you come in. Uh, share the video if possible. And there's a document description beneath the video for you to follow along with. We did just have an uh, excellent hangout, man. Um, open chat number eight. Definitely dope. Didn't expect it to go like that, so... Very interesting dialogue. But yeah, tonight's uh, topic is Black Tech Talk, Episode 250, transport uh, Teleportation and Quantum Computing. Touch on this stuff at a high level. Um, we, we discussed it briefly um, about a week or so ago on space and technology, but uh, I think we need to put more emphasis behind it tonight. And reason being is that um, we haven't focused on it. Uh, this is a um, relatively new topic to us. Well, maybe not to us, but to, uh, you know, the base of um, subscribers that we have. Um, people aren't really touching on um, teleportation at that at that level. And when you think about teleportation, you think about the many applications and aspects that it has um, in store because you have to be um, you have to be uh, uh, aware of some of the um, some of the applications of teleportation. Uh, we're talking about, I mean, for right now, we're just talking about the basis of, of, of teleportation, right? We see it in the movies and. Uh, Star Trek and these other other uh, uh, sitcoms and whatnot, but there's actually um, a reality for um, teleportation and quantum computing. A lot of people really don't. At least a lot of people in the in, in uh, the black community don't really know that because um, one, it's about literacy, and that's what we're trying to deliver tonight. And two, it's about the application aspect behind it uh, is this even possible if it is possible how do we get involved in this so that we're not getting left behind all right and if anybody wants to get on the panel you know um Feel free to join the panel if you want to. Uh, we'll drop the uh, email in the chat so that you all can email and actually get on the panel. All right, give you guys another 30 seconds before we get started. All right, let's get started.
yeah, Dr. Phoenix, you know, um, that was a great broadcast. You know, thanks for coming through, man. If you want to get on this one, um, feel free to do so. Uh, there's a, there should be a link in the chat or um, a link in your email uh, so you can get onto the panel. All right, so first item on the docket is, uh, you know, what is this quantum computing, right? Um, quantum computing is a completely different aspect from what we have today, which is parallel computing. And so when we talk about parallel computing, we're talking about x86 microprocessors um, that are 40-plus uh, years old. Um, so they, they've had a very long life in terms of um, computational power. The, the only problem is that um, with, pal with parallel uh, computing and classical, uh, the classical aspect of it is that when you double the amount of power, you also double the amount of transistors that go into um, in into the cloud computing aspect. I mean, not the cloud computing, the parallel computing aspect. This is important because the more power you try to squeeze out of that processor, that parallel processor, um, the more heat it's going to put out and the more transistors that's going to be needed um, and the smaller the micron is going to be uh, for the process aspect, you know, for manufacturing. And the scalability of x86, 64-bit computing, is not um, as robust as you would get out of, let's say, quantum. And the reason why quantum is so um, highly sought after after um, parallel computing is because of its capabilities, right? So with parallel, uh, oh, parallel, sorry, uh, with quantum computing, um, you don't have the same um, algorithms that go into, let's say, parallel computing, x86, Intel-based processors, right? Intel-based processors work off of a instruction set. Um, uh, I think it's called SIMS, uh, S-I-M-D, um, single instruction multiple data set, um, if I remember correctly, that's how it's pronounced. And in that regard, what happens here is um, the computing power is is all locked into one application, and um, although it it has multitasking capabilities, it's one application can hog up all of the processing power, and and thus um, you lose efficiency, and the processor gets hot, and then so on and so forth. With uh, with uh, quantum computing. Um, things happen more in a sphere rather um, rather than a block, right? So what we're looking at here on 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 the screen is the positioning of quantum states versus the classical states. So classical being parallel computing, x86 is what I was mentioning before. So in quantum, what you have is a rounded state, which also falls in in a spherical in a, in a spherical uh, state. So if you take if you take this first state here, um, this first spherical state uh, state here, and then you begin the algorithm process, which is um, activating the spread, right? So activating the spread or the application itself, and then two, you're encoding the problem. So what's happening over here is the encoding aspect. The encoding aspect means the exponential aspect behind it. Um, what makes qu uh, quantum computing so favorable is because it's exponential uh, math capabilities, uh, something that the parallel com uh, uh, classical computer does not have. So the three phases uh, of, uh, within the algorithm itself in the block sphere, which is what you're looking at right here, is, is, a, is a rounded um, algorithm um, sphere, works in uh, what they call qu uh, quantum bits or qubits. So you have zero and one, and then the exponential aspect happens after you hit one. So on, so once the, uh, 
once the spare one, once once spare one spins up the um the algorithm, spare two is already ready to do the processing, and then three is already ready to go full power. Um, it, it doesn't show it here in this um in this uh diagram here, but or at least this topic the topology here, but what's basically happening is everything is happening in real time where you're not waiting for anything. It's just already being processed ahead of time. Whereas in parallel computing, you don't really have that. If a thread fails on the parallel side of computing, then what happens is the application can never advance. That's what we call a hanging um, app, right? Um, so if you ever use Windows before, you'll know that uh, if an app crashes, um, your CPU pegs to 100%, and therefore the rest of the computer is is in a failed state. It can't really uh, operate beyond that until you kill that application. So that's that's one of the um, you know what is what is about quantum computing. That's that's the um, that's the basic. Uh, behind it. Now, the processing aspect of it is that, at least from a physical standpoint, is that these are microwave processors. And these microwave processors are locked into a cylinder cube that um, that are joined together through pipes um, to connect those microwave uh, processors um, for whatever speed they're moving at, uh, whether it's uh, 5 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz. I, um, I've seen some um, uh, some uh, white papers about 60 gigahertz, which is a lot. It's a lot of processing power to have um, from a microwave standpoint. They get put into this cylinder, and then they need to be refrigerated because they're um, they put out so much heat, and they need to be cooled. So the uh, the uh, temperature for to operate these things happens to be below 300 degrees um, uh, Fahrenheit. So you're talking about so cold that even human beings can't, um, it, it's not sustainable for human beings to even be uh, within it, right? Uh, with Palo computing, you know, x86 processing, um, you'll notice that um, most customized computers that people build in the gaming community always run some form of liquid cooling. Um, and they even go as far as to run it in mineral oil in order to keep the computer cool and, and stable and running. Uh, with quantum computing, they need a lot more than that, right? So they need to actually deep freeze these sort of um, these sort of computers. Um, so you're talking about operating these things in, in very cold climates, you know, whether it's uh, Greenland or this, uh, the South Pole, for that matter. Um, they need to be kept in a very uh, isolated and cooled environment. Let me see what's the next item on here. Uh, Hooded One says teleportation cannot happen without sonic booms on either side. Right. If you say so. So what are the... Um, second item on the docket is what are the uh, quantum computing applications um, that go into this? So machine learning is one. So machine learning would allow... Um, Machine learning is uh, an interesting application because of the numbers that need to be run, um, that need to be crunched, uh, which is what quantum computing is really uh, big on, right? Quantum computing doesn't really work well with big data, but it works well with numbers. So if you're going to run a quantum computer, it's going to be application specific. And you're not going to play video games on quantum computers, but you're going to run a lot of numbers on there. Um, so big financial institutions are going to love quantum computing for that very reason, uh, because there are numbers shops, so they need to crunch numbers, and that's where quantum computing comes in. That stock market as well, right? So uh, New York Stock Exchange and other uh, international exchanges are going to look at the numerical uh, crunching aspect of of uh, quantum computing as as a possible opportunity.
And the same thing goes for like material sciences and um, biological uh, life sciences as well. So CRISPR, um, things like CRISPR, where um, they have to connect all these um, all these genomic um, frameworks and put them in place. And if you're trying to scale, um, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, uh, the fastest way to do that would be through um, quantum computing. So let's, uh, let me share my screen real quick. All right, this is from analyticsindiamag.com. How quantum computing is becoming a reality. I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'm just going to give you a synopsis on what's going on. We have, a long worked, we have long worked on quantum mechanics, and it has been suggested since 1980 by element scientists like Paul Benoff, Yuri Manin, Richard uh, Fenman, and David Deutsch, Deutsch, that quantum computer can be created. One of the biggest solutions in our minds, in all of our minds, is whether such a system is a is even a real possibility. In this article, we will see what the latest developments are and try to in, uh, em, uh, emphasize um, the future of this field. Firstly, a quantum computer is a computer that uses quantum mechanical principles like quantum entanglement and uh, superposition for computation. The quantum world indeed is in bizarre is bizarre, and there are a few things to support the claim. Quantum computers, unlike the classical ones, can store information at zero or one or the supposition of both. We have been using the word. Uh, superposition very often, and so I feel obligated to explain what it is. For this, let's perform a small experiment. Take a coin and toss it. We observe that we get to, we get either a head or a tail. This is analogous to the classical computer where information is stored either as a zero or a one. Now let's move on to the next section of the experiment. Take the coin and spin it. It is, e it is very interesting to note that in this case, we cannot predict the state of the coin or the course until it settles down. This event is in which both the possibilities exist at the same time is called uh, superposition. Another important difference between classical and quantum computers that is is that quantum computers use the property called spin, unlike uh, charge by their counterparts. The, inf the information is stored in qubits in quantum computers. We will now move into the most intriguing section of this article, a recent development in this field. In 1994, Peter Shor gave the Shor's factoring algorithm, which in a nutshell informs us that we'll informs us that well-developed quantum computers will be able to factor numbers into their factors way faster than the conventional computers. This has great uh, implications, or implications, sorry. The RSA cryptography, which works on the principle that finding the factors of a large composite number is difficult. When the integers are prime numbers, our prime numbers will fail and thus several new methods are now being proposed. This has led to a new field called quantum cryptography. 
several tech giants like IBM, Intel, Microsoft, and Google, along with NASA and uh, uh, Ursula, have already begun investing tons of money into this field. This quant the quantum processor designed by Google called Bristol Cone 72 qubit gate system recently reclaimed the top spot for the world's largest quantum computer processor by dethroning IBM's quantum uh, processor with 50 qubit uh, gate system. IBM has launched its quantum computing uh, group called IBM Q. The quantum computers are accessible over the cloud. This has been used to build a game called Hello Quantum, which is available in both App Store and Play Store for free. The evolution of various emerging technologies like machine learning, deep learning, prob uh, probabilistic new, uh, neural networks, blockchain, etc., requires very high computational speed. This requires supercomputers, and in some cases, even those are slow. Thus, it is imperative that we move on to a technology that provides better speed and various other parameters under consideration. One such system is, qu is a quantum computer. This is the very reason for the massive investment made by tech giants, as mentioned before. We are still in the nascent stages of the technology, and there is a long way to go to achieve quantum computers that are more efficient, cost efficient, and better than the existing ones. One of the challenges that all research groups face is the fact that as the number of uh, qubits increases, there is uh, decoherence. Decoherence is the measure of how long the information is retained in the quantum chip. To sum things up, there is a lot of work that needs to be done before we have a full-fledged quantum computer and hence a lot of opportunities to perform research and contribute towards the field. So what do you think is about to happen? So I mentioned this before that um, the, the limitations of parallel computing or classic computing as they call it. And this is where quantum computing comes in. Um, if you look at a lot of the uh, quantum computing computers um, systems, um, they're massive in size. They're like refrigerators, if not bigger. And What's happening here is that we're in the very early stages. If we compare it to if we compare it to um uh parallel computing now, I mean, yeah, you have quote unquote microprocessors, but you know the the uh quantum computer is not a microprocessor, it's one big ass processor for the most part. All right, let me get to this next article. This one is from uh, Bulletin. Twenty quantum computing companies making minds uh, making mind blowing breakthroughs. Uh, I just want to cover some of the uh, companies that are being listed. If there's an emoji that perfectly encapsulates quantum computing, it's the exploding head. Consider, for example, that the temperature of most quantum processing chips must be kept as close to absolute zero, roughly 460 degrees Fahrenheit um, below zero, as possible. I talked about that earlier, that um, quantum computers need to run at a very frigid level. Or that some physicists think Quantum computing is the first technology that allows useful tasks to be performed in collaboration between parallel universes, or that a quantum computer recently made history go backwards. True, it was only a simulation, but still brain-blowing stuff. Before we get carried away, though, let's consider the foundational uh, basics. Cloud classic computer uh, computers operate using binary bits, storing data, and running processes using ones and zeros. Quantum machines, however, run on multi-state components called qubits, which can reach the superposition, um, superposition of 
essentially being both one and zero while also entangling in combined states. In lay terms, this that means quantum computers can do lots of things typical computers can't, including crunching massive amounts of complex information faster than an over-caffeinated uh, cheetah in a time-lapse video. At this point, imagine those, those applications is a bit like daydreaming about Christmas in May. There's plenty of anticipation and even wonder, but the big, but the big day itself remains a long way off. That's because so far, no one, no one approach to quantum computing has proven ideal. Also, the key work of stabilizing those uh, qubits is arduous and expensive. As theoretical computer scientist Scott A uh, Aronson told Gizmodo, actually building a useful quantum computer is a massive technological undertaking. Even so, an increasing number of companies, including the well-funded startups and several major players, Google, IBM, Microsoft, that have partnered with research institutions to pool uh, wallets and brain power. Are they trying to close the gap between present and future? When quantum computing is perfected, they know it will transform a host of industries, medicine, fusion and energy, plasma science, climate change, electric vehicles, finance, artificial intelligence, and information security. This is um, very interesting because, um, and that's what a quantum computer looks like in the picture. This is very interesting because you're talking about fourth industrialized industries uh, that are going to be uh, the biggest beneficiaries of all of this um, that we're talking about. Um, let me read it again. Um, medicine, fusion energy, plasma science, climate change, electric vehicles, finance, AI, and information security. Uh, it should be considered cybersecurity, but that's uh, <clears throat> neither here nor there. So these are the industries that they're, um, that they're going to be tapping into and in the applications that are going to be driving it. Let me share my screen again. We'll get to this next article. All right, so this one is from dbta.com. IBM expands its quantum computing program to Africa. We've been talking about Africa a lot in this um, on this channel because it's uh, very integral to the uh, new emerging technologies. IBM is expanding its quantum computing efforts to Africa in a new collaboration with the University of uh, which university in South Africa? Which university is the first African academic partner in the IBM Q network and will be the gateway for academic collaboration across South Africa and to the other 15 universities who are part of the African Research Universities Alliance, Aurora? According to IBM, quantum computing should be able to help solve certain uh, problems such as chemical sim simulations and types of optimization that will forever by, uh, be beyond the practical reach of classical machines. IBM established the, Q, uh, the IBM Q network, a community of Fortune 500 companies 
startups and academic institutions and research labs working with IBM to advance quantum computing and explore practical applications for business and science. It is anticipated that researchers at WITS will investigate the use of quantum computing and machine learning in the fields of molecular biology with a specific focus on HIV drug discovery and co uh, cosmology. The teams will also jointly study quantum teleportation with IBM, a field pioneered by IBM fellow uh, Charles Bennett. For Africa to remain competitive for the coming decades, we must get the next generation of students quantum ready, said Dr. Solomon Asifa, Asifa Vice President em Emerging Market Solutions and Director, IBM Research Africa. As part of a, as part of the partnership between IBM and WITS, scholars from the other 15 Arua universities, including Addis Ababa University, University of Ghana, University of Nairobi, University of Lagos, University of uh, Ibadan, and uh, many of these other uh, universities here. Uh, I'm not going to read them all off. IBM's recently unveiled unveiled IBM Q System One is the first is the world's first integrated universal universal approximate quantum computer system designed for scientific and commercial use. IBM's most advanced universal quantum computing systems are available through the premium IBM Q Experience platform. More than 10 million experiments have run on the public IBM Q experience, and users have published over 160 third-party research papers. Also, developers can work with uh, 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 QuizKit, I think that's how you pronounce it, a full-stack open-source quantum software developer development kit to create and run quantum computing programs. To further increase the skills, increase skills development, IBM Q is hosting an invite-only uh, Q's kit uh, camp in South Africa this December for 200 quantum researchers and computer scientists where they will learn in an immersive uh, environment and receive hands-on training. So what, one of the things that um, that really struck me here is that uh, this quote, he says, for Africa to remain competitive for coming decades, we must get the next generation of students quantum ready. If you guys got to really pay attention to this type of stuff because this is, this is the way they're thinking. This is what they're talking about, being quantum ready. All right, let me get to this next one. Can Bitcoin, all right, this one is from CryptoBriefing.com. Can Bitcoin survive Quantum computers. Expand, expand my screen up. Quantum computers have arrived and new models are introduced every year. Most recently, IBM demonstrated a brand new model at this year's Consumer Electronics Show. Most quantum computer research is currently limited to academic institutions and major corporations, but the technology will become more widely available in the not so distant future. But it isn't really good news. Quantum computers pose a serious threat to most modern cryptography. Because they are extremely powerful, quantum computers will eventually be able to break many encryption schemes that are currently in widespread use. Cryptocurrency is at risk as well because 
Bitcoin and other blockchains rely on encryption as a fundamental level. Here are here are some of the potential problems and a few reasons to worry and not to worry. Cryptocurrencies store funds and and address addresses which rely on encryption. Each public address is controlled by a private key, a secret number that allows you to send your coins elsewhere. Most cryptocurrencies use elliptic curve crypt cryptography, which relies on the difficulty of factoring extremely large numbers. It's effectively impossible to derive a private key from a public key, except by random guessing. Since each private key is hundreds of digits long, doing so would take an impossibly long time with contemporary computers. But quantum computers have access to advanced algorithms that could deduce private keys extremely quickly, at least for the most common uh, encryption schemes. There are some measures that can be taken to protect a, a user's funds. In the future, mainstream cryptocurrencies will probably adopt Lampert signatures, which will provide quantum resistance at the cost of larger block sizes. Ethereum plans to add Lamport signatures in version 2.0 or Serenity. This will be an, an, an optional feature, so Ethereum users will not lose access to their funds. Bitcoin developers do not have uh, firm plans for Lamport signatures, but it is a widely discussed possibility. There are also there's also some security in existing encryption schemes. Quantum algorithms can check, can crack an address if it if it has a known public key. So it is advised to use each public key only once. But even if everyone moved their funds to a quantum safe address, inactive wallets will still be vulnerable. And it's hard to predict how the market will react if some coins are safe and others aren't. Mainstream cryptocurrencies will have to adopt, will have to adapt, but some altcoins have been working on quantum resistance from the start. Many quantum re resistant algorithms already exist, such as XMSS, uh, Keycock, Winternet's which are being applied by projects like QRL, uh, HCash, and IOTA. Sometimes these schemes are used together since each works uh, slightly different, uh, differently. And often they require the public address only be used once because each transaction reveals compromising information. Quantum resistance schemes are hard to break, but they are comparatively easy to Put in place. Blockchain developers don't need a quantum computer in order to implement a quantum resistant encryption scheme. And some of these schemes are actually very efficient and economical. That said, that said in order to ensure that a network is truly quantum secure, developers would need a way to make sure all users and nodes update their software. Bitcoin mining also relies on cryptography. I'll bet in a different way, miners dedicate large amounts of computing power in order to solve cryptographic puzzles in, in exchange for block re rewards. The fact that countless miners are powering the network means that Bitcoin is decentralized. No single user can control it. If one user gains access to a quantum computer, they could produce hashes very quickly and gain dominance over the Bitcoin mining network, potentially exposing the network to a 51% attack. But many developers believe this is not a serious problem as long as multiple users have access to a quantum computer. No single quantum computer will gain dominance over Bitcoin mining. Alternative proof of work mining schemes can, make, can also prevent quantum uh, dominance and sub Studies have found that ASIC devices, which are already faster than normal computers, can reduce the quantum advantage over mining. Additionally, proof of stake cryptocurrencies avoid these problems entirely since they do not rely on mining. 
So the crypto industry can be vulnerable to this. Um, for for um, wallets and 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 nodes that are not 2.0 compliant could fall victim to a a quantum computing brute force attack, which would read the numbers relatively quickly in the encryption um, and, and completely decrypt the uh, decrypt the uh, transaction. So quantum computer does have its um, malicious um, aspects to it as well. If I'm a nation state, if I'm China, if I'm Russia, and I want to break into U.S. military uh, 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 um, cryptographic systems or systems that are based on cryptographic hashes, that could easily be done at, at, at the drop of a hat. If I'm a nation state, I'm spending big money on quantum computing because I need the advantage. Whether it's in space or it's on the ground, it, I need to have the advantage if I'm, an, if I'm a nation state actor from an advanced persistent threat, APT. Although I would be interested in hearing how this actually works from a um, business to business standpoint. If I'm a bad guy and I have access to quantum computing and I want to bring down, you know, a financial institution or something to that effect or some um, some medical uh, um, healthcare institution that has uh, all these um, PHI and these EMRs, um, you could find yourself in some serious trouble if you're the victim. Because you you don't have the immense uh, computing power to stop something like this from even coming into place. I mean, the closest thing you're going to have is an ASIC, um, and that's used for mining as well, uh, or or used for machine learning as well. Um, I think the most cheapest aspect of, of countering something like this would be um, using GPUs as uh, co-processors in parallel with the uh, CPUs that you have in place. All right, let me get to this next article. All right, this one is from Engadget. AI can simulate quantum systems without massive computing power. It's difficult to simulate quantum physics as the computing demand grows exponentially that uh, the more complex the quantum system gets, even a supercomputer might not be enough. AI might come to the rescue, though. Researchers have developed a computational method that uses neural networks to simulate quantum systems of considerable size, no matter what the geometry. To put it simply, believe, uh, to, to put it relatively simply, the team combines familiar methods of studying quantum systems, such as Monte Carlo random sampling, with a neural network that can simultaneously represent many quantum states. The appeal is easy to grasp, at least. Quantum phys uh, physicists could study complex systems without needing massive amounts of computing power. That could help scientists understand more aspects of uh, quantum behavior. The technique might be particularly helpful for developing quantum computers, but what, uh, where it could determine the effects of noise on, on the hardware. All told, the, this should nudge quantum computing one step closer towards the mainstream. This is an interesting practice. So uh, from an application standpoint, artificial intelligence um, has the ability to simulate um, a quantum computer, but not provide the actual brute force power that it does have. 
of a quantum computer. So you're kind of getting, um, you're kind of, you know, uh, utilizing AI as a um, as a fake turbo, turbo boost to a system that doesn't exist, which is actually um, very cost effective uh, if, if you are on a budget. But if you need true quantum computing power, you're going to have to go out and pay for it. But there are ways around this. Uh, supercomputers now, um, like from Cray, uh, who just partnered with AMD on a building a new supercomputer, um, even those supercomputers are not as fast uh, as, as a uh, quantum computer. But that's, you know, you're taking aging old architecture to uh, utilize it to compete with, uh, or as an as a, um, alternative to quantum computing that's, that's you know it's an apples to orange comparison but um if you just need a uh, nutritious taste that you would get from either an orange or an apple um you really can't beat the ai uh simulation uh for the cost All right, this next one is from physics.org. Scientists unveiled the first ever image of quantum entanglement. For the first time ever, physicists have in, managed to take a photo of a strong form of quantum entanglement called Bell entanglement, a uh, capturing visual evidence of an elusive phenomenon which a baffled Albert Einstein once called spooky action at a distance. Two particles which interact with each other, like two, photon, uh, two photons passing through a beam splitter, for example, can sometimes remain connected, instantaneously sharing their physical uh, states no matter how great the distance which separates them. This connection is known as quantum entanglement, and it underpins the field of quantum me mechanics. Einstein thought quantum mechanics was spooky because of the instantaneousness of apparent remote interaction between two entangled particles, which seems incompatible with elements of his special theory of relativity. Later, Sir John Bell formalized this concept of non-local interaction, describing a strong form of entanglement existing. Uh, ex exhibiting the spookiness. Today, while Bell entanglement is being harnessed in practical applications like quantum computing and crypto uh, cryptography, it has been uh, captured in a single image. In a paper published today in the journal Science Advances, a team of physicists from the University of Glasgow described how they have made Einstein's spookiness visible in an image for the first time. They devise a system which fires a, a stream of entangled photons from a quantum source of light at a non-conventional at non-conventional objects displayed on liquid crystals materials which change the phase of the photons as they pass through. They set up super sensitive camera capable of detecting single photons, which would only take an image when it caught sight of both, both one photon and its entangled twin. Creating a visible record of the entanglement of the photons. That's an image of, of, of the uh, Experiment. Come on.
So we've seen all these applications um, being satellite uh, satellited around quantum computing. And I want to make, make you know put some emphasis behind this before we move on. You don't get rid of parallel processing or classical um, computing just because you have um, a quantum computer because quantum computers are very application specific. They have very limited use outside of their intended purpose. So you're always going to have parallel computing, but it's nice to know that you can have all this parallel computing power be uh, complemented by quantum computing. We went over this um, article the other day, I think. Um, I'll reiterate it again. Oh, so this one is from the energy.gov. So this is from the uh, Department of Energy for the federal government. Unleashing a power of quantum opportunities. I'll read the first paragraph so, uh, so get and understand what they're talking about. Moore's Law is bringing us to the physical limits of conventional computing. Thankfully, the DOE National labs and world-class researchers specialize in breaking boundaries and opening possibilities, like in quantum computing, the next frontier in the information age. Working with our interagency partners, the Department of Energy is striving to advance that frontier. Many of these partners will assemble this week at the Quantum Summit at the University of Chicago. The event is hosted by the Chicago Quantum Exchange and includes representatives from DOE, including um, Argonne and Fermilab. The, <clears throat> it's two premier Chicago and national labs, the Department of Defense, the U.S. National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and the technology leaders, including IBM, Microsoft, and Alphabet. The summit will cover a range of topics, including research collaborations, workforce development, and investments in quantum science and technology. In September, the department announced $218 million in funding for 85 research awards in quantum information science. Scientists at 28 institutions of higher learning in nine DOE national laboratories will tackle developing hardware and software for a new generation of quantum computers uh, synthesizing and characterizing new materials with special quantum properties and probing the ways in which quantum computing and information processing can provide insights into the dark matter and black holes. So, item on a docket, you know, um, basically talks about, um, item number five on a docket basically talks about um, the relationship between quantum computing and teleportation. Well, here, here you have it. Uh, item, item, item number three says, uh, what kind of skill set is needed for quantum computing? So the skill set that you would need for quantum computing is a computer science background or a computer engineering background, but more preferably computer science. Um, that being said, um, although that's the overarching background, you have to have a curiosity to actually engage this sort of uh, technology. Uh, it is not for the faint at heart. So, number four on the docket uh, basically says um, supplemental learning. Let me share my screen real quick. This one is from edx.org. Um, the building blocks of quantum com of a quantum computer, part one and part two. Um, the enrollment started this morning, so you're already a few hours behind if you're gonna if you plan on signing up for this course. Let me read the uh, let me read the caption. 
in my screen note. There is no doubt that the quantum computer and quantum internet may have prof many profound applications. They may change the way we think about information and they could completely change our daily life. But how do you, but how do a computer, how do, uh, this is poorly written, but how does a quantum computer and quantum internet work? What, sp what scientific principles are behind it? What kind of software and protocols do we need for a quantum computer in a quantum internet? Which disciplines of science and engineering are needed to develop these? And how can we operate a fully working system? In this series of uh, two MOOCs, we take you through all layers of a quantum computer and quantum internet. So this is part two of, of, of the abstract. All right, so it says what you'll learn, an overview of all building blocks of a quantum computer, including microarchitecture, compilers, quantum error correction, repeaters, and quantum algorithms. A deeper, deeper understanding of the building blocks of a quantum internet and the protocols and networks needed to realize this. The scientific principles behind the quantum computer that make, the, that make quantum technologies possible. So if we go back to the top, we'll see that the length of the course is actually six weeks and requires an effort of six to eight hours per week. And the price is actually free. Uh, but if you want to pay for a uh, certificate, you would have to pay 50 bucks for it. And it starts started this morning. So you really can't go wrong with um, this sort of uh, certificate because that's what's going to show up on your LinkedIn. That's what's going to show up in, in Indeed when they go look for you on Dice and on Monster. No one's saying you're going to get a job with um, working on quantum computers right now, but what will happen is eventually you're going to have this certificate in your in your uh, in your LinkedIn. Um, profile and people are going to look at it and say, this guy knows quantum because the way recruiting works is that they look through keyword search and they type in quantum and they look up how many people actually have this in their background and they're going to see that you have it because you enrolled in one of these courses on uh, edX and you can, you can speak, um, you can speak in terms of holding a conversation about quantum computing at this point, which makes you a very viable person in other areas uh, because your skill set is transferable. Hey, what's up, Cool Breeze? All right, this next course is from EDX2. Um, it says, uh, this one is from the University of Toronto. Quantum machine learning. We talked about that earlier in the beginning of the Hangout about um, possible designations and applications for uh, quantum computing. And that happens to be uh, machine learning. So it says quantum computers are becoming available, which begs the question, what are we going to use them for? Machine learning is a good candidate. In this course, we will introduce several quantum machine learning algorithms and implement them in Python. So this is actually a pretty good course. Um, if you have a Python background or looking to aspire into getting into Python um, and machine learning, uh, this is actually a very good course. So it's free, requires 68 hours per week for nine weeks. Um, on his class, and if you want a certificate, you'll have to pay um, 49 bucks for it.
And the last um, item of supplemental learning is uh, from IBM itself. This is the documentation of the user guide uh, for quantum computing. So looking at it here, it says in introducing the IBM Q experience, the weird and wonderful world of qubit. Multiple qubits, gates, and entangled states. Quantum algorithms. Quantum error correction. So those are some of the uh, fundamental areas of uh, supplemental reading because um, this information is out here. So fifth item on the docket says, uh, or questions, how does quantum computing work with teleportation? Um, it's a good question. Um, let's look at it from zero to 100. You have all this um, computing power that is very good in specific areas, such as numbers specifically, and what you have is teleportation that requires on other number numeric uh, algorithm and schemes to get the desired result um, as a um, as a part of the um, the, uh, the testing process or actually the production process. Sorry. Okay, let me go to the sixth item on the docket. Six I don't want to talk it. All right, this one is from Slash Gear. Quantum computing research researchers teleport data inside a diamond. Read this real quick. Researchers at Yokohama National University have successfully teleported quantum information securely within the confines of a diamond. The team says that the study has significant has significant impl implications for quantum th information technology and how far and for how data is stored and shared in the in the future. Researcher Hayato Kosaka says the quantum teleportation permits the transfer of quantum information into an otherwise inaccessible space. He says that it also allows the transfer of information into a quantum memory without revealing or destroying the stored quantum information. In the experiment, the team ran the inaccessible space they used were uh, carbon uh, atoms inside a diamond. Those atoms are made of linked but individually contained carbon atoms. Each carbon, um, each carbon atom uh, has six protons and six neutrons in which nucleus uh, surrounded by six spinning electrons. When they bond into a diamond, the lattice uh, they create a notoriously strong, it's notoriously strong. However, diamonds can have defects where a nitrogen atom exists in one of the, in one of two adjacent uh, vacancies where uh, carbon atoms should be. This is a nitro, uh, this is a nitrogen vacancy center. When surrounded by carbon atoms, the nuclear structure of the nitrogen atom creates what uh, Kosaka, Kosaka calls a nanomagnet. So that's where we are with um, – 
that's where we are with um, quantum um, tele uh, teleportation and quantum computing. The ability to actually use a diamond to uh, transmit data from one place to another uh, within the diamond itself. They don't say how big the diamond was, but you know, they they were able to do it. Hey, what's going on, Paul Bryant? Let me get to the next item on the docket. All right, so next item on the docket is teleportation as an application. I think we kind of touched on this already. Um, transportation of uh, data has been tested already. Let me scheme over this article real quick or skim over this article real quick. This is a, another one of those paywalls, I think. Um, let me see what I can do about this real quick. What is going on with this website? All right, let me get to this uh, now. Let me share my screen real quick. All right, this one is not working. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Scientists attempting to open portal to a parallel universe. Come on. All right, this one is from the Independent. The discovery of a concealed mirror would, uh, sorry, the discovery of a concealed mirror world may, may sound like a science fiction uh, from the Stranger Things series, but this has been re uh, repeatedly suggested by a physicist as a tempting means of explaining uh, anomalous uh, results. However, as, as yet, 
hard evidence such a realm exists has refused uh, to manifest itself. One uh, one set of uh, anomalous uh, results and the ones which inspired uh, the research date back to the 1990s when particle physicists were measuring the time it took for a neutron particle to break down into protons once they were removed from an atom's uh, nucleus. Two separate experiments saw the neutrons broke down at different rates, including, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, instead of decaying and becoming uh, protons at exactly the same rate as we expected. In one, the free neutrons were captured by magnetic fields and herded into laboratory bottle, cap, uh, bottle traps. In the other, they were, deduct, uh, they were detected by the subsequent appearance of proton uh, particles from a nuclear reactor steam. Those particles fired out in the stream from the nuclear reactor lived on uh, average for 14 minutes and 48 seconds, nine seconds longer than those from the bottle traps. It may sound like a small difference, but it has uh, troubled scientists. But the, experiment, uh, the ex existence of a mirror world offers a credible explanation that there are two separate neutron lifetimes and it could be or it could be that around 1% of neutrons could be crossing the divide between our reality and the mirror world before crossing back and then emitting a a detectable proton The new experiment will fire a beam of neutrons at an imp impenetrable wall. On the other side of the wall, a neutron detector will set up, which normally would expect uh, to, to detect nothing. But if the detector does register the presence of neutrons, the theory is that they may have gone through the, long, the wall by os oscillating into the mirror world becoming mirror neutrons and reappearing in this universe and thus or and and more uh, specifically the lab in Tennessee only the ones that can oscillate in the and then come back into our universe can be detected furthermore the team will set up magnetic fields on either side end of the wall, which they can alter in strength. It is hope certain uh, it is hope certain strength may assist in oscillation of the particles. Despite the tidy theory, the team is playing down the chances of revealing reality's shadowy twin. I fully expect to measure zero, Miss Brassard said of the initial test. But they do not. But they do detect a neutron on the far side of the wall, which could have profound implications. If you discover something new like that, that that game totally changes. Miss Bosar told NBC. The existence of a mirror world could also explain the one uh, could also explain our universe's lack of isotope lithium seven which physicists believe doesn't match the quantities the Big Bang would have created. So this is very interesting that they're able to actually um, they were actually able to uh, establish this. Yeah, Paul Bryant, I, I figured you would be on here, but I knew you were at from um I knew you were out here racing this weekend, so I I, I didn't expect you to be on the panel at, at this very moment. So they've actually demonstrated the ability to um 
move particles um, through um, photons, neutrons, and electrons. So. Yeah, Paul. The next, um, the next car hangout um, will be. It would actually be the um, the twenty eighth, Paul. All right, this next one is from Space Daily. NIST physicists teleport logic operation between separated ions. The physicists, physicists at the National Institute of Standard and Technology have teleported a computer circuit instruction known as a quantum logic operation between two separated ions, electrically charged items, uh, atoms, showcasing how quantum computer programs could carry out tasks in future large-scale quantum networks. Quantum teleportation transfers data from one quantum system to another, even if the two are completely isolated from each other, like two books in the basement of, se of separate buildings. In this real-life uh, form of teleportation, only quantum information, not, not matter, is transported as opposed to the Star Trek version of beaming an entire human beings from, say, a spaceship to a planet. Teleportation of quantum data has been demonstrated previously with ions and a variety of other quantum systems, but the New York, the New York sorry, the new work is the first to teleport a complete quantum logic operation using ions, a leading candidate for the architecture of the of future compu uh, quantum computers. The experiment, the experiments are described in the May 31st issue of Science. Please so. We verified that our logic operation works on all input states of two quantum bits from 85 to 87 percent. Profitability, uh, probability, far from perfect, but it is a start. NIST physicist uh, Dietrich Lieberfried said, "A full-scale quantum computer, if one can be built, could solve certain problems that are currently intractable." NIST has contributed to global research efforts to harness quantum behavior for practical technologies, including efforts to build quantum computers. For example, computers to perform as hoped, for, for quantum computers to perform as hoped, they will probably need millions of quantum bits or qubits, as well as, as as well as ways to conduct operations between qubits distributed across large-scale machines and networks. Teleportation of logic operations is one way to, uh, to do without direct quantum mechanics, uh, mechanical connections, physical connections for the exchange of classical information will, will still be needed. The next team teleported a quantum-controlled knot, or C-knot, logic operation or logic gate. 
between two beryllium ion qubits located more than 340 micrometers apart in the uh, separate zones of an ion trap, a distance that rules out any substantial direct interaction. A C naught operation flips the second qubit from zero to one, or vice versa. Only the only if the first qubit is one, nothing uh, nothing happens in the first qubit as one. In typical quantum fashion, both qubits can be uh, superpositions in which they have values of both one and zero at the same time. Um, so I'm not going to read this whole thing, but this is just uh, some um, supplemental reading on the application aspect of um, teleportation. Paul Bryant asked in the chat, does the quantum teleportation of data also radically increase the data transfer rate? That's actually a good question, and it does um, work at quantum speed. So there is something called a quantum network. You're talking about something that's instantaneous. I mean, what we have right now from a legacy network perspective is pretty fast. Um, whether, it, whether you have Comcast Verizon or internal network that has a 100 megabit, 1,000 megabit connection, that's still relatively fast. You're not really waiting on anything. I can't imagine what this is um, doing, you know, for, for network speeds and bandwidth. All right, um, let me see if I can get to the, uh... yeah, most of these articles are pretty much the same. Um, but again, it's supplemental reading for you guys. Uh, Paul Bryant asked in the chat, um, Mike V, could quantum data teleportation also make use of crowd computing or cloud computing? Uh, clarify that for me, Paul. I think you can probably do something like that, Paul. And let me, let me read Paul's uh, comment. Um, he says, I mean, can quantum computers use wireless communication to use other computers in an area to increase power? Um, yeah, there's something. Um, I'm trying to remember the protocol off the top of my head. Um, there's a wireless protocol in place that actually addresses that. Um, I think it's called um, WIPI, uh, W-I-P-I. Uh, I would have to look it up. There's the actual protocol that goes in with that, that does discuss that. But if you have quantum networks in place, you know, you won't have to really worry about that. That's a whole nother, um, a whole nother discussion in terms of what you're asking. 
but it is possible. All right, I'm not going to spend too much time on the rest of these um, because a lot of those articles we've already um, are pretty much in line with each other. Uh, The eighth item on the docket is what is the social impact of teleportation? Um, So the social impact of teleportation is the advancement of human, human existence. You're talking about the ability to move matter from one space to the next. The ability to move um, matter from one place to the next, I mean, it's actually uh, only this type of stuff you see in movies like Marvel and and so on and so forth. Um, but if they're talking about actually doing something like this, um, in the near future, uh, well, I shouldn't say the near future. Near future could be 50 years from now or within our lifetime. That's, um, you know, that's progress. That's definitely progress. So that's the social impact is the ability for uh, moving humans or dark matter for that uh, that matter to another location. So let me just give my final thoughts. Um, we've gone over m- many articles tonight, and um, one thing that stuck out to me was the piece on Africa, where they're talking about cultivating and developing their people so that they're quantum ready uh, for a quantum uh, um, for this fourth industrialized uh, society. They're not waiting around, you know, for a handout. Um, in many YouTube spaces, you hear about people, um, you know, wanting to be hooked up with a job and all this other stuff. But um, there is a need um, for high-performing people in this in this regard. Let me see. Uh, see if I can grab the uh, quote again. For Africa to remain competitive for the coming decades, we must get the next generation of students quantum ready. This is important. This is part of my uh, closing thoughts that um, if you're not quantum ready, if you're not ready for uh, artificial intelligence, you're not ready for machine learning, you're not ready for any of these fourth industrialized um emerging trends coming out that's going to have a very long life on on the market. You're talking the next 25 to 30 years it's going to be on the market for. Um, you, you, you know, you're going to find yourself in, in, the, in a uh, downward spiral where you're the permanent underclass. So having this discussion now is better than to not have it at all. So those are my final thoughts. Um, just going to open up for the next maybe uh, five or ten minutes. Hey, Paul. Hey, Paul. Tra- thanks for coming through, man. Travel safe. If I don't hear anything in the open chat by um, 11 o'clock, I'll shut it down. But definitely um, quantum computing. If you go to IBM's website, uh, the link's in the um, in the docket in the description of the video. Um, the quantum computing um, uh, uh, IBM has um, already established is already free to use. Um, and all it requires is Python. 
So there's there's an API that connects to the um to the to the quantum computer, and you can run your code against it. Um, your Python code will go against it. So several several areas of um, skill set that's going to be needed. Um, computer science, computer engineering background, um, Python for writing code. Don't need to be an expert, but you need to be able to write code and you know the quantum computer will do the rest of it for you. And then start taking into consideration um, Start taking into consideration some of the industries that's going to follow behind it, which is um, finance, medicine, um, all types of uh, research uh, um, pro uh, projects will need to be worked on for the next maybe 10 to 15 years at best. So you can, they're going to need research scientists um, and research analysts that can actually um, make sense of all of this um, transactional data and actual um, data lakes and the necessity to work on uh, quantum computing from an API standpoint. Dr. Finch, you should have the link in your um, in your email. Check your email, uh, Dr. Phoenix. Hey, what's going on, Dr. Phoenix? Yeah, what's going on? Uh, again, great talk. Um, you know, the uh, you're absolutely right. You know, just to speak to even the healthcare piece of this, the, the, the skills now that are needed for um, clinicians. I mean, I don't think, um, a lot of people don't think you might need these skills in the healthcare field, but being able to program in, in Python and it's very important, especially for those who are looking to get, you know, PhDs and, and you know, they're looking to become research scientists and such. I mean, a lot of these programs, are, you know, a lot of these programs, these PhD programs, they're, they're, in reality, all PhD programs are interdisciplinary, meaning that they cross a number of different fields. Um, and so specifically in the health sciences, medicine, whatever, you know, you're 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 required in many scenarios to know how to uh, code in Python and stuff like that. Because I mean, a lot of this is just the basis for dealing with you know large sets of data and stuff like that. And and, and so I mean, again, the, in the applications of this is in terms of quantum computing and, and healthcare. I mean, are just tremendous when you consider the fact that you know, you deal with large amounts of data in the healthcare arena within biomedical research that are, um, uh, that they require large amounts of computing power. Right. So, uh, I'll just. No, that's, that was actually good points um, and coming from somebody like you. But um, to finish up my closing thoughts, um, basically um, the skill sets that you're gonna need is uh, computer science, computer computer engineering background, um, you're going to need Python as a uh, code writing skill set. Um, you're also going to need um, maybe the ability to write C++. Could, could, you know, give or take, it probably wouldn't hurt you to learn some of the, uh, some of the data structures behind it and um, the Boolean and syntaxes behind it. Um, IBM has this stuff available for free, so they have these uh, toolkits and stuff set up. You can go to GitHub, make sure you have a GitHub, a GitHub account, register that up so you can get involved in some of the um, some of the um, projects that are, are in place, some of the development kits and uh, projects that are in place already. Also, um, make sure you join Stack Exchange because uh, IBM actually has a Stack Exchange um, section, form section 
for uh, IBM Q, which is the quantum computing um, product available um, that we're talking about here. Uh, Google has their own um, quantum computer, uh, quantum processors and computer uh, set up. Uh, th I think it's outperforming the, uh, the, the IBM product um, by a couple dozen of qubits. But as one of the articles stated, you're going to need at least a thousand qubits to get actual um, competing um, computing time that you would get from a parallel processor. So with that being said, um, parallel processing is not going to go away anytime soon. But quantum computing is more of a uh, is a complement to parallel processing, classic computing. So the ability to uh, still be able to write code on classic uh, um, parallel processors, uh, which is the x86 Intel AMD chips, and have the fluidity to work on a quantum computer makes you very, very powerful in, in, in today's uh, emerging economies. Just having one of those certificates from EDX on your LinkedIn profile is going to boost you up hundreds of times uh, exponentially to other um, other recruiters and, and uh, people wanting to link up and do research projects. So the investment aspect is actually uh, fairly cheap going in um, for the long haul than what it would be for the short term of um, short term of just not doing it at all because you have no interest in it. I mean, again, I mean, I mean, you, you, I mean, you, you said this many times before. Many of the brothers, myself included, have said it many times before on these panels. You know, again, this comes down to to brothers being proactive and getting ahead of the curve here instead of playing catch up. I mean, even in the tech tech field, you know, we're we're typically playing catch up. You know, I, it, it was within the last few years where I saw black folks really start to jump on this mobile app development. Like, the time for that has came and went. You know, you should have done that, like in the early days of iOS and Android. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, that was two thousand nine. Yeah, and you know, but you know, you had black folks just. I, I think this was like maybe just like three or four years ago that were talking about jumping into the to the mobile app development. Like you know, that that time has came and went, and they're on to you know, you're you're talking about AI, you're talking about machine learning. Now we have quantum computing and stuff like that. I mean, this is where it's at right now in terms of technology and and, and um and ability to to um in 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 my field, for example, deal with large sets of data, as I said earlier. And also, you know, if you're if you're a biomedical scientist, you're dealing with large molecules that you know you're trying to come up with 3D imaging for, that requires a significant I mean any of you know a lot of your brothers are are in tech and computer science. So you understand that trying to render a 3D image of, of a very complex molecule is very taxing, you know, not just on the computer itself, but the GPU. And so again, you know, you, you need huge amounts of power to 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 drive. Uh, <laughs> you know, you need huge amounts of power to you know to just drive, just being able to to deal with a lot of the data that you see that gets used and worked with on a daily basis in the, in the healthcare sector, in the biomedical sciences and research sector. And so again, you know, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago I was talking about the. Uh, the, the some of the some of the NIH research that I've 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 done over the last couple of years, and that how essentially you have the NIH and and some of the various schools at the NIH that are partnering with Google for cloud computing, and you know obviously that's been around for a while, but the next logical step obviously would be integrating um, quantum computing into that mix, just because uh, you know. There, there. I, I cannot stress enough that just how much data there is out there in the healthcare sector that does not get nobody doesn't do nothing with it. I mean, it's it, it, it is wide open. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, you know, a lot of these jobs are being, um, you know, uh, handed off to uh, you know foreigners or which are H one B visas um, because there's not enough minorities actually getting into this. Um, but now, you know, with this administration's halting on H-1B visas and whatnot, um, a lot of this, a lot of these opportunities are starting to come back. And, you know, we got to make sure that, you know, black people are ready, 
you know, for for these sort of um, opportunities when they come and when they pop up. I mean, you're absolutely correct, and I'll give you a prime example. One of my, uh, you know, I have I talked about having a number of mentors. I I think this is one place too where brothers need to really work on this. Have many mentors. I don't care who they are, where they're from. Just have many mentors. You know, have a mentor for whatever. <laughs> you know, if you you need a mentor, show you how to tie your shoes. Have a mentor for that. But the point is that. My, you know, one of my mentors, you know, he actually, um, he, he's a, he's an Indian, he's an Indian fellow. He's a physio, he's a, a pathophysiologist. And I started some of my basic science research, you know, back when I was undergrad with him. And that transitioned to me, I started doing research with animal models. So I was working with um, mice in the laboratory. And so we, we were doing things like inducing diabetes, inducing diabetic wounds. And we were using, we were working with some engineers, some, com some computer engineers and um, computer scientists at my, at my institution. And so we were looking at, we were looking at using um, infrared and uh, model, uh, infrared imaging to examine the, the, the healing, fa uh, the wound healing process um, um, in diabetic and diabetic mice and, and how that gets impaired and how it and how they ultimately affects um, wounds healing at a at a rapid you know at a normal rate versus a slower rate if you're a diabetic and so one of the areas that built with you know working with some of the computer scientists was that being able to come up with algorithms and models and stuff like that and so you know these are these are current um current current um skills and even now actually one I'm in a Slack group now with uh with the same gentleman and a physician that uh, that we're working with and we're working with this other brother I think I talked about him that he's a computer scientist he's a brother computer scientist he's working on his PhD but you know we're doing like three he you know he's building out a he sent me a video of a 3D model of a of a of a of a of the human of the human body that we're eventually he got in a 3D space but eventually it's going to be such where we'll be able to touch an individual point in this model and it'll be able to, to identify you know pretty much anything related to the pathophysiology of that area and, and so you know it, it's just something that we're dealing with and again you know just the amount of computing power you need to render something because I you know something like that you know this is where you know the rubber meets the roads and where brothers can find a lot of opportunity but again these things take a lot of, these aren't just things you just necessarily jump into per se, but to get to that level, you need to do, you need to, you need to be on your P's and Q's. You need to be disciplined. You need to be able to put in that work and study hard. Cause I mean, you know, you brothers, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. Like, you, you know, th these things are not easy. Even get these certifications are not easy. Everybody I know that's taken any number of certifications in the IT field, they'll tell you those exams are not easy. <laughs> you know, they're very, many of them are very hard. The, um, what was the one? The sequel. I, I hear that one's pretty difficult. You know, you know, I, 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 I know some folks who've done that one. You know, it's a lot of these things are, are, you know, these these certifications are not easy and they require, you know, brothers to be very disciplined. And, and again, you know, just being able to get ahead of the curve is all is part of that discipline. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. So let me um end the hangout now, and then um we'll catch you guys tomorrow for another open chat. We'll see what, how how it goes. Cool. Appreciate it, brother. Um, thank Peace. you again. For, thank you again for the invite, as always. Absolutely, no problem. All right. Thanks for